Today we'll finish up that article on rate regulation and insurance, which is an extremely important concept. We'll do a real quick review of the difference between retention and transfer and the whole continuum that insurance supports and then get started on insurance accounting. So last class we talked about why insurance is so heavily regulated, if it's effective or not, it does seem to reduce insurance premiums for the states that are regulated. However, you can get into a, sense, a, a situation where the market just fails. And we talked about, is the insurance industry um, too concentrated? Is there too much pricing power? And for most states, that doesn't seem to be the case. In fact, there's evidence that it's a fairly, very competitive market. So what about marketing systems and efficiency? So this is where I talked about Progressive and Geico really having a huge impact. So one of the reasons a lot of economists are not really worried about the concentration at this time of this article, but even true, truer today, is that the reason Progressive and, and Geico are doing so well is because they are so much more efficient. I remember at USA looking at some numbers of Geico versus uh, Progressive and their expense ratios, which is expenses divided by premiums, were below 20%. And the rest of the industry was in the high 20s, including USA. This is right before USA did its major restructuring and actually got its expenses down into the low 20s. But they, Progressive and Geico had a huge expense advantage over the rest of the industry. And that because of that, you know, if your expenses are 10% lower, you can charge 10% lower on your premiums and still uh, make as much money as your competitors. And so, yeah, this, this is the reason market share is shifting. It's because these firms are so much more efficient. And part of it is, is their marketing structure, their distribution system. These are direct riders. A direct rider is someone who doesn't have commission agents. It's someone who sells either over the internet or through the mail. There was one point USA was primarily through the mail, um, but now everybody's moving to the internet. State Farm has stuck with the old model of the distribution system. You'll see the little State Farm boxes around the city. Allstate has had that model, but a lot of the industry is moving to direct riding. At one point, USA was really the only direct rider out there, a major direct rider out there. And so when Progressive and Geico showed up, it, it certainly made a, a huge difference. So yeah, there's a good 10% difference between uh, the direct riders and independent agents. The frustration at USA is that at that point, USA's expense ratio looked like an independent agency company, even though they are direct rider. And so that's one of the reasons why they had their major restructuring. So direct riders are, are picking up a bigger, bigger chunk of the insurance market, causing more concentration, but for good reasons. It's economies of scale, it's efficiency. Now let's talk, this, this is a tricky topic, especially when you have regulators who have an incentive to lowball everything, to tell insurance companies, oh, you're making plenty of money, what are you worried about, so that they can push rates down lower. So how do you actually measure profitability? It seems obvious, we talked about return on equity, but there's three ways to measure return on equity. One is gap accounting. Well, a lot of insurance companies are not publicly traded, like a state farm. At the time of this article, they may not have done gap accounting at all. The second kind of accounting that we're, we're going to look at is statutory accounting. That's the accounting that the states mandate by law it is a very different type of accounting, very very different from GAAP, especially when it comes to its conservatism. And then there's the uh, economic accounting, which is GAAP accounting adjusted for economic things. Which of those do you use? And the states say, we'll use the one that most supports us cutting rates. So insurers must come to the market for equity capital. They're supplied by stockholders. They're also supplied by policyholders, but it's the stockholders for the public trading companies. They need a return. And if they don't get that return, the company will suffer dramatically. So they need to get that return. The equity capital could go other places besides insurance. 
So you need a market that's viable, is earning a decent return, and covering its cost of capital. We talked about that in, earlier. So here they're showing some statutory numbers and gap numbers. So you know you look at the difference in these numbers and you look at the different years, you might say, wow, this looks like really strong returns. However, you have to remember interest rates were much, much, much higher back then than they are today. Um, so, and, and putting in capital gains at the end, that's just going to reflect what the stock market's doing, what the bond market's doing. So that big difference in years when the stock market does well, you'll notice when the stock market is not doing well or the bond market like in 84 where the bond market really sold off um, and, and now you're looking at 87 and saying that this you know 87 had a big crash but 87 actually the stock market crashed but it was up a bunch before it crashed so it actually wasn't that bad of a year so how do you figure out a fair rate return for an insurance company so regulators like using statutory because when they use statutory they say hey look your returns have been about 10 to 12 percent so statutory you know it's lower returns it's lower returns because they're forced to be lower returns because they're using statutory data but market returns are usually much higher 15 to 7 percent so regulators are saying hey you've made 10 percent the last several years why wouldn't you be happy making uh, that lower return going forward and insurance companies say well you're the counting you're using is understating our true returns and so no we can't using going forward we can't we can't use those much lower returns so regulators consumerists they like book rate of return because it makes uh, it makes significant errors in measuring both book income and equity as a result book rate return measures are virtually meaningless such measures have been used to set regulatory policy uh, in jurisdictions jurisdiction such as California, you, you have to make a market return. Now the interesting thing is, if you force companies to write the book returns, and the stockholders need a market return, which is going to be a much higher number because maybe the price to book of the firm is like 2 to 1, so they essentially need a twice as much return, what's going to happen is the regulators do not allow them to get the required return, the stock price will fall until the the book return and the market return equal and eat each other which essentially means the stock stock value of the firm is going to have to drop down to book value which would for most insurance companies at least before 2008 most insurance companies traded at about a two to one price to book if your book value is one and your your market value is two so you have twice as much market value as your book value but the regulators say you've got a you got a price to a 10% return on book, that equates to 5% return on market value. Um, yeah, the stockholders are going to be very upset and going to cause a, a pretty significant drop in the stock price. Another fundamental mistake is failure to recognize differences between expected and realized. So regulators like to say, hey, you you made 10% the last 10 years, that was your return. You should be happy. Well. That might have been a really unusual period of time. Uh, it could have been a period of time where um, the industry was a very, very hard market where you know there's a lot of competition and you know a lot of difficult kind of pricing wars that we heard Warren Buffett talk about in in his annual report. So investors, you know, they can be disappointed that they didn't get what was expected, but going forward, they're gonna re require that higher return. So just because they got a 5% return did not mean they were requiring a 5% return. Stocks are risky, expectations are not always realized, that's why they're risky, and so it depends on what point in time you look. There's one point during the, the 2008 uh, sell-off in stocks where you had a 20 year period where treasury bonds actually had a higher return than, than stocks. So that was a short period of time. But you think about the theory, if stocks re return less than treasuries, we know the stock market needs an expected return, that is the risk free rate plus the spread. But for that 20 year period, stocks actually underperformed a risk free asset. So obviously stockholders during that 20 year period um, from 1988 to 2008, obviously they did not get the required return. They got much, much less than that. 
Um, and you know, obviously, if insurance companies have been losing money, you can't say the required return is negative. The required current return can never be less than what treasury yields are, because an investor can always buy a treasury and get that as a, a sure risk-free return. So you know, the time period you pick can be really, really different depending on what's going on in markets. So the appropriate, the appropriate way to measure the cost of capital is to use prospective market value based methods which you know what those are capital asset pricing model you talked about that on the first exam that's what i use at usa to justify usa's return on capital and the regulators has usually accepted that um, so and so i think since this article was written the capital asset pricing models become much more common and so I don't know any regulators that were not aware of CAPM and when I would file it they, they knew exactly what it meant. They might question me on some of the assumptions but essentially they, they knew CAPM and, and they would accept it because it had become pretty, pretty standard industry practice. Um, the other thing you can do and I wish I could do this for you but you know show this to you and it, it's just really really tough. Uh, because I don't have access to Bloomberg every day like I did. Um, I do like to show actual returns of this industry versus versus the S&P 500. So about the best I can do is I did find an, an exchange traded fund. I don't know anything about this fund. It's an Invesco product. So Invesco is a reputable investment firm. And just comparing um, the insurance industry, the blue line, to the S&P 500, and you can see the returns are about the same. And in fact, if you look at it, the PNC industry had, was doing much better than the S&P until the COVID. And some of you, you're writing your paper on the COVID impact on the insurance industry. Um, the insurance industry has a heavy allocation of the stock, so that's part of, probably part of what that came in. You would think with people driving less and the big gains insurance companies were getting from fewer auto insurance claims, there might have been you know, some offset for business interruption, but you, know, they, you would have thought they would have come back stronger, but they haven't. But they, up until the COVID, they were outperforming the S&P pretty strongly. A little bit higher risk, but this is an industry, so you expect it to be higher risk. So essentially, the last 10 years or so, the insurance industry has done quite well. It's, it's in line with what the S&P 500 has been doing. So there's some indication that when this article was written, the insurance industry had been doing really, really poorly. But the last 10 years, it's been doing, doing fairly well. Um, and part of that is probably the impact of, uh, of Geico and Progressive and these firms that are becoming much more efficient and a market that's becoming uh, much more rational. And we don't have the big article issues we had like the, the uh, California prop proposition and uh, the really, really extremely competitive markets. It's, it has been a pretty good time for property casualty insurance. The other thing you might notice in here is you, you go back and try to look at times where there was like a Hurricane Harvey or something along those lines. You know, you look back in some of these years, you don't really notice Hurricane Harvey was August 2017. So that, that does look like, because that is right at that period of time. Yeah, right at, right at that time, August. So, yeah, so you see something like a Hurricane Harvey, that can definitely have an impact. But the other thing that's interesting here is how quickly it came back really great uh, rise back other than that it's, it's a fairly similar line we could actually real quickly do the correlation between these two and just see it's 0.62 i don't know what a typical industry would be like but that's you know there's there's definitely some correlation you can definitely see it um so this industry has done well the last 10 plus years that's as far back as i can go i wish i could find an index that go back further but has done well, so its its return is 13.65 when the market's up 14%. Uh, most people think of PNC companies that have an beta similar to the market, and so if, if PNC stocks are up about the same as the market, that makes sense. I don't know many people who think the beta of PNC companies would be below one, 
but I don't think many people, I don't know many people think it's well above one. So most people are in the one to 1.2 range. So a s strong outperformance until COVID-19 and then slight underperformance since then. So, you know, it seems reasonable that um, the stock market is, is getting, it's getting a good return, getting a decent return from the PNC industry. So these numbers, I don't want to cover these numbers. These numbers just show how weak the PNC industry returns were in the 80s. So, um, but that is one thing you can certainly do is just look at stock market returns over a long period of time. Now, I think one of you wanted to write, was writing their paper, their paper two on the different types of market cycles, the, the hard markets and soft markets and PNC insurance. So what I just did is not a bad way to do it. Unfortunately, when looking at that kind of ETF, it excludes firms like State Farm and USAA, those firms that are not publicly traded, and it doesn't go back as, as far as you would like. So you might have to find a firm like an Allstate, like a Hartford, like a Chubb. A Ge you can't do Geico because Geico is part of, of Berkshire Hathaway, but you can do Progressive. You, you could, could probably go and do what I just did there and bring in the stock value off of Yahoo Finance and compare those, maybe those really prominent names in the market to the S&P 500 over a longer period of time and just, just see if you can see those soft and hard markets in the actual data. So if insurers are not earning adequate returns, one major problem is that insurers were hit by unanticipated inflation. It could be obviously catastrophes. At the time this article was written, this is looks like it's pre-Hurricane Andrew. I think Andrew was 92. So Andrew was really the, the wake-up call on the catastrophe side. And catastrophes probably, you would think catastrophes really hurt this industry, but catastrophes short-term hurt, hurt this industry, but long-term they can actually help the industry because it makes the regulators more open to letting companies raise their rates. If you see in California with the mudslides and the fires and everything going on, regulators might on the homeowner side say, wow, we, we better let them get their rate increases because they're paying a lot of claims. If we don't let them make an adequate return, they're going to leave this market and our, our real estate market is going to crash just like we saw the problem with mold in Texas. And so actually bad events for this industry can long term be good news because it, it softens the regulatory framework. Um, consumers say insurance claims costs are inflated mainly because of, of poor practices. I don't, I don't buy that argument. If insurance companies are not scrutinizing claims, it's because they know that the cost of scrutinizing the claims is more than what they'll save. Uh, I, the, the claim I filed when my car was, window was smashed and they stole my bike, I filed a claim, I was extremely honest, I told them exactly everything, it was kind of confusing because I had a rebuilt bike that was more valuable than the bike I originally purchased, and so I told them, you know, I bought a $1,200 bike, uh, but then when it got damaged, they replaced my frame with a $2,000 frame, and I had documentation from the, I was, I was thought they were going to debate with me and go back and forth, they were like, just tell us how much. So I told them the amount, a very honest amount, I didn't make anything up, but I was really honest with them that I... I spent 1200 but the bike was worth 2000 so I lost a $2,000 bike. I didn't know how they decide on that. I had no earthly idea of their interpretation, but they gave me the full 2000 and I said, great, that sounds good. Um, no, no challenge whatsoever, and you know, to them, challenging a $2,000 claim, if it's going to cost them $3,000 to challenge it, why, why do it? So they wait for those big, big, big claims to challenge them. So. I don't think insurance companies are saying, hey, you know what, we just don't feel like messing with it. I'm pretty sure the companies I've looked at, these are very well-run firms, very sophisticated firms, very smart people working for them. They understand the math of how much is it worth to challenge claims versus what we're going to save. So I, I don't buy that argument. Insurance premiums are set before claims are paid. Insurers, you know, they can't just say, hey, our claims are really high, so we're going to charge more, because a competitor could not do that and get a huge advantage over their competitors. So, you know, every dollar they can save on claims, that goes to their bottom line, that goes to the stockholders, or 
they can reduce their premiums and that goes to competition. They can, they can get more competitive. And then he comes, you know, here at the very end, we're getting close to the end, but here he starts hinting at his big issue, which is reforming the tort system. He kind of throws that in without a lot of data, or he and she, uh, these two writers, they throw it in without much data. We talked about the tort reform. During this time, there was a lot of tort reform, so maybe that's why the industry has bounced back fairly well. But So maybe they were right. Maybe that was the one big thing they needed to do. Um, so their final conclusion here, unless there's a change in insurance regulation, the stock market is going to penalize insurance companies, trade them at a discount because of their expectation of, of not getting the pricing they need. Stock prices will fall, um, and with that lower equity value, the rate of return, will, it's going to reflect the risk. So stocks will be cheaper to help improve, improve the expected return on stocks. Um, and you're penalizing the stockholders of these companies and ultimately they win. The ones who own the stocks before the regulatory environment gets worse, they lose. But in the long term, stockholders get their returns. So either the company's got to make the returns or the stockholder is going to reduce stock prices until they, they, their stock prices make sense versus the returns you can get. Um, so they say if regulation is not the answer. So they went through all of that and they essentially are saying regulation bottom line is probably not the best solution, especially in the states that are really harshly regulating like California and New Jersey and Massachusetts. Um, how can we bring the rising prices? And so they get their final solution is we've got to do something about the rising costs which are only benefiting certain consumers and consumers that are either fraudulent or suing unnecessarily. So tort reform and fraud reform, after all of that discussion, that's their final conclusion without much support. So they don't give us data on how much tort is costing the system. They're probably including fraud as part of the tort. Um, so efforts to halt insurance fraud, reform the legal system is part of the answer. Um, so yeah, and we saw that, right? We saw that with the um, asbestos claims. We saw that with professional liability insurance. We saw the protection the courts gave on storm surge. We saw the regulatory reaction on mold insurance. Um, all of these things are showing that the insurance industry has won some big, big uh, issues. And because of that, maybe that's why this last decade has been fairly strong for the industry. So just to finish up this issue, so the required return for stockholders, it seems easy, it's KE, but the question is how do you measure that? Is it book value? If it's book value, is it gap or stat, or is it market value basis? Now, I'm just going to tell you something, I don't have any evidence on this. I just, I'm basing this on the CFOs I've talked to. A conference I went to here's my sense is most management so this is this is professor sweet only most management looks at gap return on equity so most management looks at gap return on equity the stock market looks at market return on equity, market ROE. Does that make a big difference? Well, here's Progressive. Progressive is a big PNC company on the auto insurance side. Here's their price to book. Their price to book is more than three to one. So think about that. Let's say management says, you know what, the stock market needs a 15% return. So management says, okay, we're targeting 15%, but they're measuring it on a gap basis. Well, if the stock is trading for three times gap, then that 15% on a gap ROE basis is only a five, less than 5% and a market value basis. So if price to book, so price to book says, what does the market think? And book is, here we're using gap, you could use stat, which is even a lower book value. If that's three to one, then a gap ROE will be 67% too low for stockholders. Now, 
I think this is going on, but I cannot prove it. The reason I say that is CFOs that I've listened to, they talk about their returnal equities and then they use the capital asset pricing model. They compare gap numbers to their capital asset pricing model. I've never seen one actually go back and look at their price to book. And so I was at a conference, an Ibbotson conference, and Ibbotson is really big on this capital asset pricing model. That's, that's what their whole model, their whole business exists, is to do consulting services on the capital asset pricing model. So I asked the speaker then, um, a gentleman, Dr. Chen, he took over after Dr. Ibbotson retired, and I asked him this very question, and his response was, oh, I never thought about that before, and that just shocked me. That seems like, this seems so incredibly material, um, and I got this from the CFO of, of, from the CFO of, of companies here in town. Um, it's just, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing if this is the case. This would make a great research paper for some PhD student. Is there, the, is there this huge disconnect? Now, obviously, price to book is one to one. That would be okay. Right now, banks, banks used to trade at a two to one price to book. Now, today, the more, more of them are trading one to one. It doesn't matter. But if you're looking at a firm like Progressive, trading at three to one, then it, it makes makes a big big difference. So price the book is interesting to think about. So yeah, you if you're saying your KE is eight percent and your return on equity is fifteen percent, you you have to say, well, wow, we're doing. We're doing great. We're making 15% and the market only wants 8. But if your price to book is 2 to 1, then you're essentially making 7.5 and, and the market requires 8. So this is a question some of y'all, as you get out there, ask this question. I think you'll be amazed, as I was, that a lot of managements look at their book returns and assume they're meeting the needs for their stockholders. And that just doesn't make sense to me. Um, all right, we already talked about these other things. We did the premium calculation already. Uh, we talked about the formula and my my big thing about net income, we're gonna subtract the change in required capital. So we got all of this in the spreadsheet. One last thing to talk about here, which we'll see this when we do Schedule P. This is extremely important. I learned this in talking to actuaries on both the life and the P&C side, is actuaries think in accident year terms. Accountants think in fiscal year terms. When we see Schedule P, you're going to see why that's so critical. But actually, say, okay, we, we, we sold the policy in, in 2020, in 2020, but in 2024, we got new information about that, that year. We had new claims happen, and so we, we had to make an adjustment. So in 2024, we have to make an adjustment for business we sold in 2020 because we got new information. The actuaries are looking at the profitability of the business they wrote in 2020. However, you don't go back and restate 2020's financials. All of that fix that you're doing for business you sold in 2020, it's all going to go through 2024's business. So if you discover you over-reserved in 2020, let's say you reserved an extra $200 million in 2020, and then in 2024 you discover, wow, that was too much, and you release that extra $200 million, your 2020 will be understated by 200 million, and your 2024 will be overstated by 200 million. The accountants are saying, wow, we did really bad in 2020, but we did great in 2024. The actuary says, no, that's all 2020 business. Look at 2020. And actuaries are amazingly good at this. It really just blows me away. I remember the first project I did with some life actuaries. They could tell me every product they'd ever sold every year so a life insurance policy they sold in 20, 2014 they can tell me exactly what the return on equity on that product is even though it's not anywhere in the financials the financials is the mix of all the products all at once and um, just incredible records where they keep track because they need to know that because they've got to make sure they price the next product correctly Nice thing about on the property casualty side, there's really nothing like this on the life insurance side. But on the property casualty side, I'm going to show you Schedule P when we do the accounting. And so the actuaries actually show us all their mistakes. I mean, it's wonderful. Schedule P shows you, hey, 
for 2015 business, three years later, we had to make a $40 million adjustment. And that's either going to distort 2015 and it's going to distort 2018. Both years are distorted. One's going to be helped, one's going to be hurt. Um, but the business was written in 2015. So I, I, I love Schedule P. It's one of my favorite schedules to use. I really recommend that you look at the Schedule P for any companies you interview for, for in the insurance industry. If you can get your hands on them, a lot of these firms will actually have it on their website. We'll see Allstate actually does that. So we can actually look at the Schedule P and, you know, the actuaries may not like it, that that data is out there, but that data is out there. We can actually grade the actuaries on how, and in fact, there's actually two columns in Schedule P where you're essentially grading the actuaries on how good of a job they did in setting up reserves and forecasting claims. So it's, it's pretty amazing. And remember Warren Buffett said, we should not discount property casualty claims because there's so much under-reserving. I think that might be true for the really long tail lines like asbestos, but I think we're going to see when we look at, at all states' financials that their Schedule P shows that they're, they're pretty accurate, they're pretty good. Their errors are unrelated, sometimes they're over, sometimes they're under, but pretty accurate. I mean, you look at the actual numbers, you say, wow, they, they were within a few percentage points on their estimates, and probably, in general, they tend to slightly over-reserve. I know that was true where I worked, where the, the reserve and actuaries actually put in a 3% cushion. And that 3% cushion would decline over time as, because once you pay it in cash, the reserve goes away. So if you put in a 3% cushion, as time progresses, that 3% cushion is going to come in and look, and it's going to make future years look better because you're releasing reserves you did not need. All right, so I'm trying to get you excited about Schedule P. I really love it. I think you're going to find it, especially actuary is going to find it really interesting. It's, it's a really intriguing schedule. Before we get into the accounting, though, the property casualty side is right quite unique versus other insurance, especially life insurance, annuities, health insurance. Property casualty side, insurance follows a continuum. Insurance that we're used to, which is mostly transfer, to insurance that's almost entirely retention. So we're used to guaranteed cost insurance. That's when we buy auto insurance, homeowners insurance, and we pay a premium. That premium is based on the insurance, the insurer's estimates of losses for a class of insurance. So they're not going to price it based on what you do, they're going to base it on a class that you are in. Now you might move to another class, so if you have an accident, and we, we used to have, I remember going to some board meetings and seeing one of the questions they'd always get would be a consumer who was just really upset, and they say, hey, my son had an accident, and as soon as he had an accident, accident you, you jumped up his premiums and you're just trying to get, you know, you had to pay a $10,000 claim. You're just jumping up his premiums because you want to get your $10,000 back. And USAA would say, no, that is not true. When your son had their, his accident, he moved into another class of insureds. He moved from a class of insureds who haven't had an accident into a class of insureds who did have an accident. We assume because of that his frequency and severity went up, so we weren't charging him based on his specific situation, but on his class. And that's what guaranteed cost insurance is. The whole class might see their rates go up because of the experience of the class, but you individually will have no impact on your premiums. All your individual activity does is decide which group you go into. And the insurer needs a really large population to be able to, to price each, each class. Then there's experience rated plans. Now here with experience rated, none of us would ever have experience rated. This is for our large insureds and they have maybe they're insuring their workers comp and they have maybe 20,000 employees or 40,000 employees. Well then you can say, you know what, some of our premium is going to be based on your experience and some of it's, the rest of it's going to be based on your group. The higher the credibility, the more the premium will be based on your group. So higher credibility means we, your group's large enough and you have enough experience that we can price more of the policy based entirely on your group. Um, so the experience rated plans, you have a credibility factor, so maybe it's 20%. So 20% of your premium is going to be based on your history and 80% will be based on your class. So. 
And as I just said, just because your insurance company increases your premium after an accident, that is not experience rated plan. What's happening there is you've moved to another class. That's a guarantee. It sure looks like it, and a lot of insurance thinks that's the case, but that's not the case. So an experience rated plan, your activity can actually increase your rates based entirely on your experience. Whereas with guaranteed cost, your activity, all it can do is move you to another class and in your premium we base. Remember, we talked about this with the state. You can't charge Bob more than you charge Mary just because you don't like Bob because he had an accident. You have to charge, charge Bob and Mary the same. So Bob had an accident, Mary had an accident, and they're now both in the same class. You can charge them both the same rate. But you can't charge Bob more just because he had an accident and you didn't like the fact he had an accident to try to get your money back. That would not be legal because you have to file your basis for the higher rates. Very close to experience rated plans is retroactively rated plans. And so this is probably a little bit more, more retention than transfer, but here the premium is based on the current policy, but the premium is not known until the end of the year. So the premium, the insurance company is looking to see the actual experience, and once they get the actual experience, then they'll charge you a premium. Now you might say, well, that's not insurance at all. If I don't have an accident, they'll charge me 100 bucks. but if I have an accident, they'll charge me 20000 bucks. That doesn't seem fair. Well, where you get the insurance is that you have a range. You have a max and minimum premium. So within that max and minimum, you're essentially self-insuring. You're insuring yourself. So if that range is $1,000 to $2,500, between $1,000 and $2,500, you're insuring yourself. But if you have a $20,000 claim, your premium goes up to $2,500. You don't have, you know, you're covered after the $2,500. So the wider the range, the more you're self-insuring. The narrower the range, the more you're transferring, you're tra transferring your risk. Then we get something a little more balanced. I'm, I'm not sure there's a huge difference between retro retrospectively rated plans and administrative service only plans. There, there could be a little difference, but but administrative service plans, this is essentially the insurance company saying, you're outsourcing your claim settlement to us. We're gonna handle your claim settlement. Our premium that we charge you, we're essentially charging you to pay, pay your claims. It eliminates your need for internal staff. Now that sounds like entirely retention, but these also have a stop loss measure. Where they say, okay, we're, we're gonna pay all your claims. This might be workers comp. We're gonna pay all your claims. However, if your claims hit $20 million, you don't have to pay anything over $20 million. So once you hit that stop loss, now you're transferring risk. Below that stop loss, you're essentially tr insuring yourself and, and a, and really, the big difference here is that the stop loss tends to be pretty high, so it's, it's probably 90-something percent self-insured, and a small percentage, those really crazy years where you just have huge losses, there you get some transfer. And then you have some that are almost entirely, if not entirely, retention. Captive insurance companies, this is when an insurance company, I mean, or when a co corporation buys insurance from a company that they wholly own, from a subsidiary. So essentially they're buying insurance from one of their one of their own companies that they own. And a lot of times they're the only customer. So they buy insurance from, from ABC Insurance Company. They own 100% of them, and they're the only they're the only insured. It, whenever you see things like that, you can be pretty sure there's a tax reason for it. And we talked earlier, we, when we remember early in the semester, we said, why do corporations buy insurance? If the capital asset pricing model says they don't need to, that, that, that risk has already been taken care of by the diversification of the stockholder. And here's one of those reasons we talked about. Insurance, by its nature, gets preferable tax treatment. It's real complicated. Insurance companies are some of the most complicatedly um, taxed companies in, in the world. But they do get some favorable treatment. And, you know, especially how they get to deduct losses over a period of time rather than having to wait until the loss actually happens. And the federal government actually set up a special captive program related to terrorism risk after 9-11. One, one of our students is writing their second paper on that, how, how terrorism risk is, is impacting 
the insurance industry and I recommend and he go go look up that federal program and you know get that into your paper because that's a pretty important concept and then the last one it, it sounds fancy finance risk plans finite risk plans but essentially all that means is if something happens to you you have a line of credit that you can draw on so you essentially can borrow money and you got to pay the debt back so it's not free so it's all risk retention with the exception that ultimately everything's transfer if you go out of business so if you go bankrupt so let's say you have a car accident you cause a large liability loss you don't have any insurance so you retained it all well if you go bankrupt eventually all that risk transfers back to the other person and so if, if eventually bankruptcy is the ultimate transfer of risk so you know we talk about those asbestos companies you know, once they go bankrupt, the risk transfers to the insurance company. Once the insurance company goes bankrupt, there's there's no more. Uh, you know, the transfer goes to uh, back to the person who had had the loss. So you know, you, you if there's no one to sue, if there's no one with money, it, the risk bounces right back to you. You're retaining it, and uh, the other person's transferring it back to you. All right, so. The insurance industry is probably more heavily skewed for these later ones. This is the personal lines that we're used to, auto and homeowners. But remember, the insurance market is over 50% corporate. And the corporate side tends to be more on this side. The smaller smaller entities, the small private school, uh, might be more in this, in this camp. Although, one private school I worked with, on their workers comp they actually did some experience rated they did look at our actual claims it didn't impact our rates much but it did a little bit so even a small private school we got a little bit of the experience rated. all right so here we go to the next topic insurance accounting I know it sounds sounds boring but uh, it's extremely important I think it's more interesting than accounting in other places because it's it's very unique they do not teach insurance accounting or banking accounting in undergraduate. I think they should. It's a big part, part of the market. I think we really should rethink how we teach accounting. We still do it so much in the old industrial world with a lot of um, inventory accounting and FIFO and LIFO and those type of things. But doing loss reserves and uh, loan for loss reserves, you know, bank loan loss reserves and those type of things, I, I think that's, that's pretty important. Uh, because you see that a lot in this industry. So I'll introduce you to some things you probably did not see in your accounting classes. I'm quite sure you didn't. But before we do that, next, cl next class we'll actually look at actual live financials of an insurance company. But to give you a little introduction, I'll have a little bit that's both PNC and life, PNC and life, and then we'll, when we get in the Schedule P, we'll get directly into property and casualty only. only. So insurance companies have two sets of books. Now they may have another two sets of books uh, on top of that, but they have two sets of books, gap accounting and statutory accounting. They might have some internal management reporting and then the tax reporting. And in fact, the tax reporting might be more pages, longer, more pages than the actual gap and statutory. Uh, well, gap statutory is probably longer. But gap reporting, that's what you're, you're taught undergraduate. It's, it's assigned by the uh, Financial Accounting Standards Board, FASB. They set up the rules. GAAP tries to be more realistic. There is some conservatism to GAAP, but ultimately they want to be realistic. It's very earnings focused and maybe even cash from operations focused. So the focus is on GAAP net income. We're, we're, you know, if you look at the stock market, they're so, so focused on earnings per share and net income. And revenues very focused on the income statement. It's a very consolidated business, so that's our frustration. If you want to look at Geico, you really can't look at Geico because when you when you go to Berkshire Hathaway, everything's mixed together. You might be able to pull out a few items on Geico if you go to their segment reporting. You might get a little bit, but it's not going to be much. Maybe their revenues, maybe a cost of goods sold, but. Definitely not a balance sheet, definitely not a full net income statement. So it's all consolidated. So statutory accounting, these are the rules mandated by state law. Now when I started my career, 
Um, I, I got one year of, of accounting, and it was interesting where I worked, it was not a publicly traded company, it was at USAA, and when I started there, they only did statutory accounting, and within a few months of me starting there, they decided to start doing GAAP accounting. So they were doing both statutory and GAAP. And the way they did GAAP is they took their statutory and they did what they called GAAP adjustments. And I can still remember that. It was in an Excel spreadsheet, actually a Lotus spreadsheet, but I'll call it Excel. Uh, you've probably never heard of Lotus, an IBM product that competed before Excel. But everything was in this spreadsheet. And we, had all the st we did all the statutory first, and then we had a column for GAAP adjustments. I'm going to talk about some of the gap adjustments, but that's the way I learned how to do all of this. And then as time progressed, we became much more focused on gap and much less focused on statutory accounting. But statutory accounting, I don't think you can really fully understand an insurance company just looking at the gap financials. You really do have to understand statutory. So I would learn statutory and then learn the gap adjustments. I really think that's the best way to learn. I'm not saying it's the only way to learn, but it's the way I, I, I was brought into it. And the reason I say that is the actuaries are so focused on the statutory side. And then the gap, and that's the way they think. They give you statutory reserves and then they give you the gap adjustments. It's very conservative. It gives you lower net income than gap. It gives you lower assets, higher liabilities, and lower net worth. And the focus is not on the stockholders. The focus is on the policyholders. So their goal is to make sure this firm does not go insolvent under this regulatory regulator, regulator's watch. So protecting the policyholder. So you want to be conservative. You want the firm to be showing warning signs well before they're going to go under. So the focus is much more on the balance sheet, much more focused on net worth. They don't even call it net worth. They do not call it net worth. They call it surplus. It, they tend to do unconsolidated, so you have your life insurance companies and your property and casualty companies are separate, and all of your property and casualty companies have their own financials. Now, whether you can get your hands on all of those financials is another question. Um, on the PNC side, you can get their consolidated PNC. I don't think you can get consolidated life. And that's something that was being debated. They used to not do consolidated life, and there was some discussion about starting to do a consolidated life insurance. But they, they've always done consolidated PNC and a statement for all the subsidiaries. So on, this, on the PNC side, and I remember this when I worked, I could get these statutory financials for the PNC company consolidated and for all five, six of the individual companies. And they were all available, and you could get down to that level of detail. It was pretty amazing. Um, now, if you go online and you look at, say, Allstate, on like Yahoo Finance, you're getting the consolidated Allstate, which includes the life insurance, the property and casualty insurance. Well, property and casualty is the biggest, the, the head of it all. Life insurance and a bunch of other subsidiaries. And remember at one time, I think people forget, it's pretty amazing. Sears is going out of business. But Sears used to own Allstate and used to own the Discover Card. So it's pretty interesting. Allstate and Discover Card are now uh, much larger than Sears as Sears goes out of business. Sears spun those two firms off. So there was a time back there that you could not look at Allstate at all. Just like with Geico being part of Berkshire Hathaway, so you got Fruit of the Loom and you got railroads and other things mixed in there, you cannot look just at the insurance operations. Um, Allstate at one time used to be part of Sears, so you couldn't even look at Allstate. Now that Allstate's been spun off, when you look at the GAAP financials for Allstate, it's the consolidated Allstate that includes both the property and casualty and the life insurance. And that's really not very valuable to you as an investor. And so that's why I think statutory is so important. If you're, if you're an investor, if you, let's say you're going to work for an investment firm and you're, you're going to analyze insurance companies. So a great career path would be Start your career at an insurance company, learn all the insurance, and then move over to the investment side and become an analyst of that industry. It will give you a huge advantage. And one of your huge advantages is being exposed to statutory accounting. And once you know you have statutory accounting, you now have access to a lot of incredible detail that you cannot get 
from the standard 10Ks and 10Qs that companies publish. So it's, it's good to know that it's there. It's a pretty amazing amount of information. All right, so as we get into this, I want to talk high level here, and then we'll come back, and it's going to be a little bit redundant when we come back, that we'll repeat some of this stuff. But high level for insurance companies, we've already seen this, right? We saw this when we did the pricing. We separate the premiums from the investment income. The investment income is a major part of that income, but it's below the line. You have underwriting, and then you have the investment income. Very, very different. You would not see this with any other, you know, think about any other company that has revenue, then a bunch of expenses, and then revenue again. Very unusual financial statements. Now, with the GAAP financials, they do mix the investment income in with the premiums. If you're an analyst for this industry, you would never do that. You would always separate those two from each other. Uh, there is very unusual accounting on the premium side. I don't know if we'll get into it. Uh, I might hit it at a very, very high level in here, but there's, there's very unusual. Um, the investment income is below the underwriting gain and loss. We always separate these, so when you look at GAAP financials, on Yahoo Finance, it's just—it's not anything we'd ever use as an analyst of this industry. It just, it just doesn't make sense. Your cost of revenues are essentially the claims. So your claims, some of them are paid in cash, and then you add the change in reserves. And we'll see this when we do Schedule P. What reserves do you have? Well, you have three of them. You have loss reserves, so that's the actual reserve for what you think you're going to pay out in claims in the future. You have LAE reserves, that's reserves for your expenses to pay claims. So that's your, your um, adjusters, your lawyers. You actually have reserves for those loss adjustments, expenses. And then you have something really bizarre, it's called unearned premium reserves. Just think about this as unearned revenue from a gap standpoint, but it's not quite that. So. If we get to the premium accounting, you're going to see this is a really bizarre part of accounting. But um, let me just real quickly, uh, this is the time i got to at least hit it. There are written premiums and there are earned premiums. Let's see if I talk about this. I do talk about this later. I, I'm going to hold off on that. We'll come back to this later. But let me tell you that the main reason for the unearned premiums is not because someone prepaid their auto insurance. That's actually not it. So uh, unearned revenue on gap side, someone has paid you cash in advance. So maybe you pay three months of rent on your apartment. Well, that's three months of rent. That's an unearned revenue. That apartment complex would have to put that aside as a liability. They did not earn that income. That is not what unearned premium reserve is here. It's something very, very different. It's very bizarre. So, well, I, I, if we have time, I will show you that because I do think it's important before you interview for jobs here. Um, so, claims paid in cash plus a change in the reserves give you an incurred number. Now, the unearned premium, we'll have to talk about that. The unearned premium is not part of this change in reserves. So, yeah, we're talking, yeah, it's, it's we're, we're getting outside the scope of what we really need to get into. This is not an insurance accounting class, it's a finance class. They have normal expense accounting. They do tend on the statutory side to separate general expenses from tax related expenses, excluding federal, they don't, federal income tax is just like on GAAP financials and stats. They just put the federal taxes as one of the last items. But other tax related expenses, especially premium taxes. Premium taxes are paid to the states. They're not income taxes, they're premium taxes. So it's a percentage of premiums. So that is shown as a separate expense because it's such a huge one. And we'll look at it. We'll, I'll try to show you that when we look at all states financials so you can see how large that is. There are some things that are, it's what we call retaliatory taxes on the premium tax. So Texas might charge Texas companies 1% and non-Texas companies 2%. Florida might charge companies 2%. Non-Florida companies 2.5%. Texas might say, you know what? You're charging our companies 2.5%. We're going to charge Florida companies 2.5%. So Texas might retaliate, retaliate against Florida. It's, it's really bizarre. And there's actually been state legislatures have talked to each other 
to say, you know what, if we reduce our premium taxes, we'll actually collect more, collect more premium, and the other state will collect less. You know, it's, it's, it's a really quite comical what they do here. But that's the retaliatory tax. One state penalizes another state for the way they tax their companies. Um, it's, it's, it's just a bizarre world of, of, uh, of state insurance regulation. There's some other things that some of them relate to stats, some of the gap. Here's one that relates only to gap. And this, this might have been the most bizarre thing I, show, I saw, maybe, well, maybe the second most bizarre thing I saw. The most bizarre was something I saw on the life insurance side. But this applies to both life and property and casualty, and it's only for gap. It does not apply to statutory. And what the gap accounting says is when you sell a new policy, especially a brand new customer, you have a lot of expenses up front. You've got underwriting, you've got some policy issuance costs. So you're spending a lot of millions of dollars to get this product on the books up front. It, it could be you know, taking blood tests on life insurance side, it could be pulling uh, records from the state on driving records and those kind of things. So you're doing all this work up front and you spend all that money, you get this new policy. Well, that policy is probably going to stay on the books for 10, 15, 20 years. And so what they allow you to do is take all those costs that you, that you incurred to get those new customers, you get to capitalize them as assets, and then you amortize them over what you expect is the time that that policy will stay on the books. I remember the first time he showed this to a new CEO, and he was like, wait, you do what? Very bizarre. I don't know any other industry that has anything like this. Maybe software development costs, maybe, but <laughs> very, very unusual accounting. And it's quite complicated. There's something, I don't know if you remember your inventory accounting, they had um, LIFO unlocking. Well, deferred policy acquisition costs have something called DPAC unlocking. I won't go into the rules of that. I remember I had, I had an actuary explain that to me once and I understood it. And 15 minutes after he left my office, I was confused again. It is so complicated, especially on the life insurance side. But FAS, FASB accounting says it's the matching principle. All these costs you incurred are not just related to your revenue this year, but they're related to revenue over the life of this policy. So we want to match all those underwriting costs to the life of this policy. Uh, it's possible they'll do away with GAP, DAC at some time, but, um, but it's still there. It increases income for a lot of companies because they get to capitalize large expenses. Um, but it is, it is bizarre. I don't know if analysts on Wall Street, what they do with DPAC, if they adjust it out or they just leave it there, you could adjust it out. It's not that difficult to get your hands on the numbers, but it is a very bizarre part of, uh, of accounting, gap accounting. All right, we'll, we'll finish this up next time with the high level notes and then I'll show you an actual company and then we get the Schedule P, which I really enjoy as you can tell.